Welcome to the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon, live from the virtual grill room of the St. Francis Yacht Club. We hope that you're sheltering in place in a comfortable environment with your loved ones, and we look forward to greeting you back at the Yacht Club as soon as this pandemic is over. In the meantime, we're going to bring you uh, other fascinating speakers from around the world. And in fact, our speaker today is from Halifax, Nova Scotia. So I know you're wondering why larger schools of humpback whales are gathering together in Alaska. You're probably asking your friends about it at cocktail parties. And you know, you probably were thinking just as the COVID-19 pandemic has been slowing international shipping, the sounds in the ocean have been decreasing. Our speaker today has been studying this very subject and in fact has demonstrated that the sounds in the deepest part of the ocean uh, in this part of Alaska are at half the volume in May of 2020 as they were in May of 2018. His first adventures at sea started as a young lad of six, sailing with his dad on the family cat boat, a Sabo eight foot dinghy in Victoria, BC. And if you've been to Victoria, BC, you realize this is one heavenly place to begin your love affair with the water. It is a beautiful, little harbor. It's a village nestled around in hugging a harbor. It's a beautiful place. And you can sail into it as yours truly has, or you can fly it in a small plane, which I've also been fortunate to do. In either case, it's a beautiful place to imagine beginning your love affair with the sea. Um, our guest went on to sail in the Canadian Nationals in the laser class, placing a respectable 10th out of 50 in the wide part in the St. Louis River uh, in Montreal called Lac Louis. And then uh, by age 22, he was on a Canadian research vessel going across Station Papa in the Northeast Pacific near Alaska. And then by age 27, uh, he was uh, on a research trip to the Mariana Trench. And you recognize the Mariana Trench is the deepest part of the ocean. It's more than 36,000 feet deep. And it's a fascinating area for a scientist of aquatic sounds to uh, do research. And then at age 29, he sealed the deal with the woman he would marry by spending three weeks sailing 750 miles down the Mississippi River in a 15 foot cabinless dinghy. They camped every night on the shores of the Mississippi. And if you wanna learn about a person, take a 750 mile trip with him on a 15 foot dinghy. And what a way to seal the deal to the woman he's now married with. Um, educationally, he got his bachelor's of science in physics at McGill University in Montreal and went on to get his PhD at Scripps Institute of Oceanography at UC San Diego and do postdoc at Woods Hole, which is a beautiful research facility, fascinating research facility on Cape Cod. He's currently associate professor at Dalhousie University in Halifax, Nova Scotia, and collaborates with research scientists at Scripps and Woods Hole and elsewhere around the world. And his key focus and study is on the sounds and noise in the deep ocean and how to measure and monitor those. So David Barclay, why should we be studying sound in the deep ocean? We can learn a lot from just listening to the ocean. And I hope today to tell you a few things that we can learn about just the physics of the ocean, but also of course we can learn about the animals um, that live in the ocean and those animals use sound. So it's important for us to understand our human contribution um, to the ocean soundscape. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about how we measure that as well. Um, so yeah, my general area of research is on sound and noise in the ocean, including how it propagates and you know what generates uh, different types of sound, how we measure them, and you know you have to kind of approach this problem. Um, you know this is the, the question my mother would ask me: Why measure and model noise in the ocean? And historically, there's been two reasons. There's been two approaches. Um, the first is this idea of underwater acoustics. So if you understand noise, you can do a better job of building antennas, acoustic antennas to detect things like submarines, U-boats. So you can imagine this is sort of a, a hundred year old pursuit. Um, and you can also do a better job at detecting things like uh, whales. 
The flip side of that coin is this idea of acoustic oceanography. So if you understand the noise in the ocean, just by listening to it, you can understand the source and the mechanism um, that's generating that noise, be it breaking waves or rainfall or other kind of natural phenomena. And you can also understand the propagation environment. So, you know, the ocean is comprised of hot and cold and salty and fresh water with different pressure. And so that creates, you know, lenses, acoustic lenses in the ocean, and there's layers of, of these water masses. And so, you know, uh, acoustics is a way to study those um, processes. I did put this picture in here. Who am I? Trying to, um, <laughs> this is a picture from 10 years ago when I was a graduate student in San Diego. And much like uh, where you all are now, it's a very expensive place to live, especially as a student. So I lived in this one room and I was looking back at these photos. I thought, this kind of describes who I am actually uh, in, in pretty great detail. So in general, like I did my PhD in San Diego and I did postdoc at the Woods Hole uh, Oceanographic Institution. But in general, yeah, I sort of had this interest always in recording, making and manipulating sound, um, be it through listening to music or just listening to the natural world. Um, I've always grown up with an interest of spending time on the water. So you can see my surfboard there. And actually I was looking closely. You can actually see the Royal Victoria Yacht Club uh, budgie there uh, <laughs> hanging up in my room. And I'm also interested in building gadgets and, and I and I use gadgets in the in the best sense not in the sometimes people use it disparagingly against me oh this guy just builds gadgets but I'm going to show you some of the interesting gadgets we've built in my lab and and this is the first one so this is actually a photo of the Challenger deep at the Mariana Trench this this deepest spot in the world's oceans 36,000 feet you know about as high as you fly in an airplane when you go to go to Asia or Europe um, but in depth so one of the interesting instruments we've made in my lab um, is this what's called deep sound and this is just a 15 inch glass sphere this whole footprint here is about a meter squared and the, the whole thing is maybe yeah um, a meter and a half tall five feet tall or so and so it's kind of this, the size of a person a bit smaller and it's very light it only weighs about 80 pounds so you can really throw this off of a really small boat but the amazing thing is that it's pressure rated so everything on here can withstand the full um, depth of the ocean. So it can descend to the bottom of the Challenger Deep in the Mariana Trench, 36,000 feet. Um, and that's exactly where we are in this photo, right over the Challenger Deep, about to deploy this instrument. Um, so we're lowering it down with a little rope here, and then we just release it, and it, it descends under its own weight, just under gravity, because of this heavy iron drop weight. Um, the whole way down to the bottom, it makes recordings of just the sound. So acoustic recordings over a large bandwidth from you know, five hertz all the way past the, the limit of human hearing up to 30 kilohertz. And once it reaches the bottom, um, it drops this weight and returns to the surface under its own buoyancy because this is a very buoyant glass sphere. And the whole thing is untethered, so we have no idea where it's going to pop up when it, when it comes back to the surface, but it has these strobe and radio GPS beacons at the, at the surface, and then we have the, the task of locating it on the vast, vast ocean, um, this tiny little 15-inch glass sphere, and recovering it to get the data back. So this instrument has made um, a noise profile in the Challenger Deep, and it's also been to the bottom of the Tonga Trench and the Serena Deep in the Mariana Trench and the Philippine Sea. I have a map of a few of the de deployments that um, this instrument and a few of its family members, so we've made three versions of it. Um, we had a campaign in the Philippine Sea. We've had a few different drops in the Mariana Trench here. This is in the Western Pacific. And then down in the Southern Pacific, the, uh, the Tonga Trench. We actually went down and sat on the bottom for about three or four hours just listening. Right now, we're sort of working on the next generation, similar instrument, much improved electronics, has a longer lifetime, you know, better noise floor, uh, wider frequency band, but essentially the same idea. And here we are testing it here in Halifax. This is our test facility called the Aquatron at Dalhousie University, just doing some tank tests um, last year. And we've actually done some ocean tests, and now we're just waiting to get a ride to a, a deep part of the ocean to deploy this thing, make some more recordings. Uh, yeah, one of the other things that was mentioned, uh, one of the other more interesting campaigns that I've done in my uh, lifetime is recording noise in the Mississippi River. And I did this right when I finished my PhD about 10 years ago. We took this boat here. We bought this boat in St. Louis. And I think it's a Hobie actually is the, the brand. Um, and it's just a little generic, you know, 15 foot learn to sail type uh, dinghy. 
And we put uh, a hydrophone here and some recording equipment and just a little lead acid battery. And then we had all our camping equipment. And we took this down from St. Louis all the way down to, to New Orleans here on the Mississippi River, making um, noise recordings along the way and just capturing um, the natural noise in the Mississippi River. Now the challenging thing here, this is kind of the only way to do it because just like when you blow into a microphone, if you put a hydrophone in a fast moving river, all you hear is the sound of the water rushing past the hydrophone. So by sailing and floating down the river, we got a very clean, very high fidelity recording of the true noise in the river. We got rid of all that flow noise. Um, this is another little gadget that we've built in our lab recently. So going from the deepest deeps to the shallowest uh, shallows, um, this is a hovercraft actually, an autonomous hovercraft. And off the front here, you can see there's a little, um, a little submerged boat that has side scan and, and echo sounder. So side scan sonar and echo sounder on it. And we've been using this, um, it's hard to tell in this photo, but the, this is an estuary that's maybe just a foot, a few feet deep. It's, it's very, very shallow, very tidal. So the hovercraft is a perfect vessel for doing surveys of what the bottom type is. Um, we've, we've particularly been looking at eelgrass using this thing. So where the eelgrass patches are for kind of habitat um, uh, quantification. And this is the perfect um, vehicle because it can drive on land and on water. So, you know, trying to look in the shallow parts of the ocean as well. So I made this slide a bit of text here, but it's kind of just a laundry list of all the things we can learn by just listening to the ocean. So by just putting a hydrophone and recording the sound of the ocean, we can learn all sorts of things. So wind speed, wave height, um, relative wind surface current direction, that's all just from looking at the frequency content. So in music, you would say the timbre of the sound. Is it you know, uh, more high frequency, more low frequency, smoother or more textured? Um, we also could listen to rainfall and actually um, some people up here in Newfoundland did a wonderful paper where they listened to snowfall on the, on the ocean and quantified the types of snowflakes that were landing. Um, and then by looking at the spatial properties, so by measuring, you know, sound here relative to sound here, um, we can do things like measure, infer the sound speed profile, which actually, like I said, um, quantifies the temperature and the salinity. It, it tells you something about the water masses, where it comes from, what's in that water. Um, so we can do that. And we actually, um, I'm going to show you a little study where we inferred the pH of the ocean just by listening to the noise, the depth dependence of the noise. And then the last kind of more, more complex property is actually listening to the noise directionality. So just like humans where you have two ears and we can steer and, and understand where noise is coming from, we can employ those same techniques in the ocean and do things like learn about the bottom properties. So what, what's the seabed made out of? Um, we can learn about the mixed layer depth. So there's always sort of this well-mixed surface layer of ocean water. Then there's the deeper, less disturbed water. We can learn exactly where that depth is. And we're doing some work, and I put a question mark here because, you know, it's ongoing, to learn about ice properties. Um, thickness, the thickness of the sea ice, for instance, um, by looking at the directionality of the noise. So that first one I want to talk about here is actually just looking at the depth dependence and inferring the pH. And it's all of these are really simple physical concepts. And I have a little diagram here. You can imagine we take that deep sound profiler, we throw it in the ocean, it travels along this black line. And at some depth here, it's listening to the noise generated by breaking waves. So at the surface, you have these breaking waves, they're in training bubbles, and the bubbles ring like little bells. So at any moment in the ocean, you're hearing you know, an uncountable number of these little bubbles ringing out when there's even just the slightest amount of breeze um, to make little spillers in the middle of the ocean. And as you go down deeper and deeper in depth, the sound is traveling through a longer and longer path of seawater. And the interesting um, property that the absorption of seawater has is that um, as you go higher in frequency, it becomes more absorptive. So as you get further away from the surface, you hear less high frequency noise and relatively more low frequency noise. And I have a little diagram here. This is frequency in the x-axis and the received energy and the y-axis and this is what you call you know frequency spectrum so you can imagine it's like your equalizer on your stereo system and so there's some level at depth z1 and you go to z2 it becomes a little bit steeper because these higher frequencies are stripped away a little bit more as this path length becomes longer and so you can go into the theory and it turns out that's because of the borate ion the borate ions related to hydrogen and so that's related directly to ph and you know, many people have done lots of work on measure this carefully in labs. 
And if you look at a family of curves here, this is now frequency in the x-axis and this absorption um, in, in the y-axis. As the pH changes, so this is the blue line's pH of seven, right, of perfectly neutral drinking water. As the pH changes, um, the shape of this curve changes, and that's what we're measuring exactly. That's how the sound gets stripped away. And so then you can sort of figure out, well, um, where exactly would I get the exact curve that I measured dependent on the pH of the ocean. So generally speaking, this amazing thing is just by listening to the timbre of the sound as you go down in depth, you can figure out what the chemistry of that water above you is and therefore what the pH is. Of course, something we want to measure. This is an important ocean property to measure right now. Um, the other little sort of interesting experiment that we've done really recently, this was just um, over the last couple of years, is same picture here. Here's a diagram from a nice, a beautiful paper by uh, Grant Dean, who's a California scientist, um, where he's put the surface of the ocean here, and then these little stars are little breaking waves, creating little, you know, uh, pockets of sound. And this is in a shallow water. So here we're talking about on the continental shelf. You have the seabed here. This seabed is called the elastic basement. It's got some sound speed. It's got some attenuation. It's got some density. They're all determined by the grain size. The grain size is like, is it very small? If it's muddy, is it really large? Is it cobbles and sand? You know, um, all these things, maybe you think about these things when you're anchoring, but they're actually really important also for the propagation of sound because the sound reflects off of these different substrates in different, you know, ways. And so the basic idea of the experiment is we look at the direct arrivals of the sound on our two sensors. And then we also look at the arrivals of sound reflecting off the bottom and uh, arriving at these sensors. And it's essentially kind of similar to when you go into a building and you snap your fingers and listen to the reverberation and, and try and infer um, you know, what the building is made out of. What the acoustics of the building tell you about its materials. In the same way here, the acoustics of the ocean, just the noise in the ocean, tells you about the material at the, at the interface. And so you can write some long equation, very unimportant, but you know, got to show it. And from that, you can determine um, exactly what the composition of the seabed is. And so this is a, this is a you know, real dog's breakfast plot here where I have frequency on the x-axis and sound speed. So we're just trying to measure the sound speed in the bottom on the y-axis. And there's all of these researchers. We got together like something like a dozen institutions. We all went to the same spot in the ocean. We all used different techniques to measure this. Some guys were letting off giant explosions. Some people were sticking probes into the seabed and sending sound back and forth. And we were just listening. All we did was listen to just the natural noise. And this is our dashed line here. So we're falling right in the middle, um, agreeing pretty well with this, this blue curve, um, which is sort of we took as the ground truth of sound speed in this particular environment. Now, one of the things we've really been interested in, we put a lot of effort into my lab in the last five years, is trying to measure just the natural um, ambient noise field in the ocean. So I'm really interested in how these breaking waves, how can we predict the sound contribution of these breaking waves um, to noise in the ocean. And it's really challenging because you can see um, in this map here, this, the heat here, the heat, heat map of ship density. And so in this part here um, in Western Canada and, and north, Northwest of the US, there's this massively used waterway, it's called the Salish Sea. And you have Seattle here, Vancouver here, Victoria here, sh ships all the time. So, the overarching science question is, what is the impact of these ships on the noise field? What is their contribution to the noise field? Well, to measure that, first thing we need to know is what is the natural background level, and then we can figure out how much they've added on top of that, right? So we've been trying to come up ways to measure that um, background noise level, but the problem is there's always ships there, so it's always a really hard thing to measure, right? Um, and, and the idea, you can see this little toy equation here, shipping equals total minus natural. So that's so if we go out and just put a microphone there, we'll get the total. Um, if we knew that natural noise level, um, we would be able to get the total, the, the shipping noise level, the true human um, component of that um, noise level. And so mostly what we're talking about when, when I talk about natural is wind generated waves. And so this is a plot here of the wind speed. We're going up to 20 meters a second. Um, and then the noise level at 20 kilohertz, quite a high frequency. And you can see that as the wind speed goes up, you have a very nice correlation, um, the noise level goes up. And you can quantify that with one of these correlation coefficients here, 0.5, it's between zero and one, so 0.5 is pretty good. 
Here we're looking at the correlation coefficient in the y-axis and the frequency um, in the x-axis. And you see as you go up in frequency, the correlation coefficient goes up. So the question is, why is it so low down here? It's because you have ships that are masking the natural noise level and driving that correlation down, okay? And so we come up with a little model that we use to predict, you know, the idea is that we'd be able to just put an anemometer out there and measure the wind, and that would be able to measure the background noise level. Um, we'd have to, you know, account for some of the other details, how sound propagates and stuff like that. But the idea is we'd be able to predict the natural background noise level and then subtract that from the total and get the, the shipping noise level. And you can see it does pretty well. So the colored lines here are our model, and the gray line is the, um, the true measurement. And this plot here is of the difference between the model and the measurement. You can see these big spikes that show up every now and then. And that's because rain mall, uh, rainfall generates noise. So the actual sound of the drops smacking on the surface of the ocean, as well as the drops entraining a bit of air and making a little bubble that rings out. Um, so we need to account for that as well. So that's something we did. We used Doppler radar images to measure the rainfall rate. And then we put that into our model. And the second interesting thing I think will be very obvious to most people who sail, but not so much when you're looking at the, um, at the noise uh, in the ocean. We did, um, this is a periodogram of the residual, so the difference between our model and the measurement um, in, for that one spot in the Sailor Sea. And you can see these big spikes, and these spikes fall exactly on some of the tidal frequencies in that region. Now, the Juan de Fuca Strait, so that entrance to that, that body of water, has a pretty regular sea breeze where it just comes in in the afternoon. It can get quite windy, 20, 20 knots, you know, um, really pick up. But at the same time, it's got regular tides that go in and out. And so really what you're seeing is when the wind is blowing against the tides, you get steeper waves, right? And the breaking is a little bit more energetic. When the wind is going with the tides, that smooths out your waves. You have less energetic breaking. And so the the... That, that bit of information needs to be put into the model um, to deal with these big um, tidal spikes. So this was our effort until basically a few months ago. We were really um, going out on this. This is a Canadian research vessel, the, the Vector, I think. And we were going out, putting um, our recorders in. We were traveling across the country because we're based in Nova Scotia. So we're flying out to Vancouver. We're going in this vessel. We're putting recorders in. We're recovering them every, you know, every few, uh, it's like every three months. Um, but of course, that totally shut down when COVID-19 hit. So we weren't able to go out and recover those instruments. So we needed another way to look at what was happening in this region. And there's this beautiful piece of infrastructure um, called the Neptune and the Venus, Venus Ocean Observatories. And they, those are networks of underwater observatories um, that have all sorts of instruments. So we're looking at, you know, um, this is the uh, uh, ensemble of researchers in the government of, of Canada has deployed these things and they put all sorts of things on there. They're measuring the temperature, the salinity. Um, they're looking with echo sounders at phytoplankton. They're looking at acoustic noise. Um, chlorophyll, all sorts of um, water properties, and over a huge range. So there's two networks. One is in the inshore waters here. So Victoria's here, Vancouver's in here, and Seattle's down here. Um, and one of them's just in this, these sort of uh, inshore waters, we'd say the inland waterways. That's called the Venus uh, Observatory. And then there's one that travels out all the way here. This is about 300 miles off of um, Western Washington out to the Endeavor um, Seamount nodes. So this is, uh, this is where the Juan de Fuca plate and the Pacific plate meet, very interesting geotechnical um, part of the world, um, but also interesting oceanographically. And so these spots that I've marked with stars, these are all spots where um, these two observatory networks had hydrophones that had been recording for over a year. And if we zoom in a little bit, here I've zoomed in, I put the, um, traffic density. So these are routes uh, in, you know, some thousands of routes per square kilometer per year. Um, so it's a measure of density of ships, commercial ships um, along these routes. And you can see this is kind of the main route to Asia. That would be from the Pacific Northwest and from Vancouver. We have ships going, uh, turning south and then smaller. This is probably fishing vessels that are working on the shelf, you know, where you have really rich fishing grounds. And so we had two places to measure. One was on the slope, so where the water goes from sort of hundreds of meters to thousands of meters deep. This is the continental slope. And then one was way, way offshore in the, in the deep ocean. 
And then if we zoom in on this other little box labeled two, this is, you know, Vancouver, the suburbs of Vancouver here. We have ferries going from Vancouver to Victoria. We have um, huge commercial vessels coming in and out here on the shipping lanes. And we had two recorders that had been recording for more than a year at these two locations. So we're stuck at home twiddling our thumbs. We think, okay, let's use this, these observatories to, to do the study. Now this is an actual screenshot uh, of all the instruments that you can access simply by going to this website, oceannetworkscanada.ca, and just clicking. There's no login required. There's, there's nothing. This is really an amazing public service that, that, that these people um, give. Um, and each one of these white dots represents some sort of data available. Um, I think these ones on land are like size, size, uh, seismometers. And these uh, red squares, orange squares, are the actual nodes. So this is the Endeavour node 300 miles offshore um, of the Neptune array. And there's some in here. This is the Venus array, much smaller. Um, and so basically, you can go here, you can look up, and you can download the data. Anyone listening could go do this. They could get any data they wanted. There's no um, fee. There's no embargo. You can just go and start doing your, your research. So that's, we were stuck at home. And the thing that was of interest here, the, 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 the juicy bit of economic data that, that got us going on this was, this is from Statistics Canada. Um, the top line here is import in blue, export in gray, and the blue line is TEUs. These are like these uh, transport equivalent units or something like that. Uh, uh, has to do with the number of containers actually going, going in and out of the port. And you can see this is September 2018, uh, pandemic times around here, December 19, January 2020. Because we're really talking about um, you know, trade with China being the major, major contributor um, to this bit of the, the ocean. So the pandemic's a little bit earlier than um, it actually kind of started hitting us here in North America. And you, we saw there's a pretty juicy downturn here. So we thought, okay, we got to look into this more detail. Now there's also this system, some of you may be familiar with called the uh, automatic identification system. So all, a lot of larger commercial vessels are required to carry these pingers that ping to satellites or ground base stations. And they say, you know, I'm this vessel, I'm going this fast. I, you know, I'm this, I have this tonnage and I'm headed to this port and my captain's name is whatever. Um, so we looked at some of that data and it was a little more confusing. This is um, October, 2019. Here's the pandemic sort of hitting around here. And um, you know, these, we have these AIS reports um, from 2020 are in gray. So there's no real trend. And then these orange and um, yellow line, this is the number of unique contacts. So it's kind of confusing, but there's also, you know, other factors we need to look into this more detail. It might be because the type of ships has changed, maybe using smaller ships. You might have ships that are at anchor that are just pinging away all the time. We haven't really figured out this detail, but this top one was sort of the juicy figure. This downturn here was what kind of spurred us forward. So we did the simplest thing possible is um, we took the um, acoustic recordings that um, uh, at the two, at the, uh, two different offshore nodes, um, and just looked at the sound level at 100 hertz. So 100 hertz is quite low in frequency, sort of, it's like subwoofer type frequencies, low on the piano keyboard. And those are the, the, that's the frequency band most associated with ships, right? So as you go up in frequency, then you have to start worrying about wind and rain and these other factors. At low frequency in the offshore, there's not really much of, a, of an impact from the environmental factors. Um, and so it's a little bit of a better um, frequency band if you want to quantify just the contribution from shipping. And so it's pretty noisy data. And, and I think this is something that I should emphasize. You know, um, humans, the quietest sound that humans can hear is like 10,000 times quieter than the loudest sound humans can hear. So there's a huge range, a huge dynamic range that we're trying to measure over. And that's because our natural world has very loud and very quiet things happening all the time. Um, now, the way to look at this is we've plotted the median as a solid line and the first percentile. So the first percentile represents the quietest of the quiet times every week. And yeah, each week we have one point here and we're connecting them with a line. The light blue line is 2019, the dark blue line is 2018, and the red line is 2020. You can see at the Endeavour station, which is about 60 kilometers away from the shipping lane, there's a pretty consistent decrease in noise. I think it's a pretty, um, a pretty convincing decrease in noise year over year. 
I did look into the storm conditions in 2020 versus 2019, and it's actually been uh, stormier in 2020 than 2019. So you would expect this line to be above usually if the shipping was all equal, but it's actually below despite being stormier. Um, so it really, it really is convincing that there's about a 2 dB decrease um, average over these months um, in noise at 100 hertz. Now, here's the, here's the, here's the data that shows the, that has the no result data. And you can see how noisy it is at this clay quat slope. 2020 looks the same as 2019, which looks the same as 2018. There's too much noise really to make any, any difference between the, the different years. And uh, so, you know, we had one result that's quite convincing. And I think because of the, you know, the geometry of where the sensors were um, and just this, how small this effect is in the, in the offshore, um, we weren't able to measure anything there. It's buried in the noise. The story is a little different in the Strait of Georgia. So in the Strait of Georgia, um, you have much more shipping. It's very shallow. So the environment, the environmental variability in the noise is much lower. Like you don't have big, huge swells that come from, you know, that, that come from Alaska and, and bring a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of waves that way. You have kind of a flat sea most of the time. And we also had another problem. In the Strait of Georgia at the observatory, they changed the, the hydrophone in March, uh, somewhere, somewhere in here. So we couldn't just do a direct comparison 2020 to 2019 to 2018 because the calibration had changed, you know, the equipment was slightly different. So we actually came up with a way to work around that. And this plot here, I've used Delta here to show that this is each one of these black dots is the week over week change. So we take the entire week of data, you average it down to one, one number, and then you do the same thing with the next, next week and you say, did the next week get louder or quieter? And it's kind of remarkable here, this is the end of 2018, and this is all of 2019, how flat these lines are, right? So we fit a line to all these, and you can see that essentially um, the noise stays pretty constant and doesn't change too much um, over those two years. Suddenly, when we get to January and the first quarter of 2020, you get a very steep decrease. And so you can see that the noise has decreased um, week over week, kind of on an average of one or two dB every week in the first quarter of, um, of uh, 2020. And actually going beyond there, the ferry service was cut to half um, right, at, right at the end here where we stopped looking at our data. So it gets even quieter in the, in the second quarter, but we haven't quite finished the analysis yet. So what does this amount to? So this constant decrease in noise over the first three months of 2020 is it amounts to about a half decrease in power at 100 hertz in the first quarter. So it got about quieter by about a half. Now this is at very low frequencies, of course, so things are different at high frequencies because you have to contend with all the other, um, the, other me the natural mechanisms out there. But this is pretty convincing that um, you know, there has, there's some impact by the change in shipping, whether it's less ships or ships behaving differently, um, it has decreased the noise in that region of the ocean. So, then, of course, you have this question, well, why is this important and what are the impacts on marine animals? So I have to give the most honest answer, which is this is work that's um, in progress and it remains to be seen. So people are out there making direct observations and that's what's really needed right now. Even despite the pandemic, we need to get out on the water and, and make observations of um, the marine animals and how they're using the habitat. Um, but we can do some sort of speculative um, hypothesizing, right, using facts. And this, this is um, a figure that, um, that illustrates the NOAA, so that's the, you know, uh, the U.S. Um, National Marine Fisheries Service guidelines on the impacts of noise on marine animals. So kind of the state of, the best state of the art um, science on how does noise um, impact uh, marine animals of all types. And the basic idea is that there's a few, there's these three zones. So in the first zone, above some certain threshold, which is proportional to distance. So if they're very close to this, the source, it's louder. Um, so above some threshold, animals can have the exact same thing as humans, right? So if you work in a noisy environment, you get your ears, you know, your hearing gets shot. You get permanent, it's called permanent threshold shift, or we'd say hearing loss, permanent hearing loss. Um, so animals that experience, you know, these above these sound exposures, they do experience permanent hearing loss. Um, animals that have temporary exposure to um, certain, you know, above a certain threshold noise, they can have temporary hearing loss. So this is a temporary threshold shift. That's the same as going to a concert, waking up the next morning, having ringing in your ears and, you know, 
saying what all the time. And then more, uh, more applicable to, I think, the situation we're looking at here, where you have the constant noise from ships and the constant use of the habitat by the animals, you have changes in behavioral response, and those can vary. So, you know, some animals will flee when they experience noise. Some animals will stop moving, they'll freeze. And then some animals like porpoises and dolphins will get curious and go check out what it is. What's, what's making that noise? They'll swim closer. Um, you have masking. So that's when the noise of the ship would be louder than say the noise um, that the animals be using to communicate or to hunt or to navigate. Um, suddenly they can't hear those things anymore. And that's probably the greatest concern. And you have stress response. So people have done really beautiful work um, where they've measured the um, physiological stress of the animals by collecting their scat um, and the relative levels of noise at the same time and seeing that when human noise goes away, the animal's more relaxed. Kind of like living next to the freeway. Uh, you might be a little bit more of a stressed out person, maybe. Um, and then there's sort of this third zone, which is where the noise, uh, human generated noise is below that natural, um, that natural noise background, which we'd say, okay, well, it's inaudible, inaudible to human or to, to the animals, therefore it has no effect. So this is sort of the, the chart that we can use to guide the research that's happening right now, which is observing these animals um, in the wild and observing their reactions to this perturbed state. So thank you so much for listening and being, for being interested in some of this research. I've acknowledged some of my sponsors along the way. And of course, I put a picture of my laser here at the Royal Nova Scotia Yacht Club here in Halifax, just to give you an idea what it's like these days out here. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you, David. Listen, uh, I want everybody to realize that they get extra nerd credits for this talk. And um, you're all responsible for bringing in your charts and your graphs to, um, uh, to Professor uh, Barclay after the talk, and you'll be graded for paying attention all the way through. Uh, um, so, David, let me ask you, please summarize, why is it, give me a summary, why is it that people should care about sound in the ocean? What's the reason why Mr. Average, you know, um, thoughtful uh, human should care about sound in the ocean? It's a pollution just like any other, you know. I think that there's kind of an analogy I think about when I'm at home here when I, and someone in a Harley Davidson rolls by. Why is it so loud? <laughs> it does have, an, it has a negative effect on us as humans, right? And yet we allow it as a pollution in our environment. Um, now the sound in the ocean propagates super well compared to sound in the air. For instance, you know, we can detect a submarine coming out of the Bering Strait from, from Los Angeles, you know, this is something that, that the US has been doing for 50 years. They're able to track submarines over thousands of miles, uh, thousands of kilometers without being attenuated in any sort of way, any How significant sort of way. How far away can we hear a sub? How far away can we hear well, a there's a, Well, there's a beautiful experiment that was done by the, the godfather of oceanography, Walter Monk, who, um, the namesake of many, uh, of many properties of the ocean. He, let off, he exploded some dynamite at a little island called Heard Island in the Indian Ocean. And they recorded it as far away as Bermuda. Um, even on the West Coast, I believe uh, they recorded at some stations on the West Coast of the US. So essentially, if the sound is loud enough, you can hear it around the world. Wait a second, a sound coming from India to Bermuda would have to either go under South America or under Africa. Well, it goes around Africa. So if you draw the great circle route and it refracts around, um, and it, yeah, it refracts around quite, quite does easily. It bound, does it bounce off of Antarctica? How does it get to Bermuda? Uh, no, it actually, so you can actually, if you draw the great circle route, there's like a straight line as you would consider it on the globe between um, Heard Island in the in Southern Indian Ocean and, and the Bermuda. That'd be like 12,000 miles or something. Yeah, it's some crazy, crazy distance. And it's more than halfway around the world, right? So. Um, and people have done all sorts of, like, uh, for instance, the recent, um, um, recent implosion of the, the Argentinian submarine, the San Juan, people were able to detect that using hydroacoustic hydrophones, yeah, thousands of miles away. And actually, by looking at the reflections off of the continent of South America, they were able to localize it. So they, they were able to, in retrospect, help out with the localization of that, of that tragic disaster. Okay, so now we know that, or we understand that whales use um, 
acoustics to navigate and they listen carefully for other things. What else are they listening for? Well, so they communicate using acoustics and um, all sorts of different calls for different behaviors, um, but they also um, localize prey. So they're looking for food, they use acoustics to find food. I mean, I think people know that bats do that and so do, so do a lot of uh, marine mammals. You mean they're listening for the prey to make a sound inside the ocean as no, the prey moves? they're making a, basically a sonar chirp and listening to the echoes um, okay. to localize. So the, whale, the whale gives off a sonar chirp and yeah. they listen to the, the echo bounce back and that helps them locate prey. That's right. Okay, and so is there, so when a fish um, becomes the object of a curiosity by the whale, he, he sends an echo chirp over to uh, X prey, it bounces back and he can tell the size of the prey. How do we know, what's your evidence that the whale can detect size and or distance of the prey? Basically. Well, so, I mean, the biggest evidence is that we, we essentially copy them <laughs> with our depth sounding equipment and our fish finders and whatnot. Those are all essentially copies of the systems that whales have with a much worse performance. So they're able to do localized things in ways that we don't really understand how, you know, it's kind of like uh, they, on, they only have a few sensors, but they're able to do to process that in their brains in such a way that they can really figure out a lot about you know, what, where the prey is, where it's moving, and, and, and yeah, what size it is. Yeah, it's quite amazing. So when the whale is going through the water, we've said earlier that ships um, go through the water and they make sound. How many dB does a, does a liner make? How much dB does a sailboat make? Give me well, some <laughs> so a sailboat under sail would be basically undetectable very, very quiet. You would hear just some bubbles, you know, from uh, the water flowing around the hall, maybe, um, from the wake. A, uh, a liner, I would, I would, I'm not able to give you an exact number on it, but quite loud. <laughs> um, 20 dB, 1 dB, give me a number. 100 and, yeah, yeah, 100 plus dB. Over Relative to one micropascal. Now, when you say the 100 dB, if, if I'm standing at San Francisco Bay or if I'm in, in Bermuda, Spake Bermuda, and a ship goes by, I can hear the ship going by, I can hear the prop turning. Yeah. That's one level of sound. And then mm -hmm. under the same, at the same location and the same distance from the ship, will I get more sound if I listen under the water than if I'm listening in the air above the water? Yeah, it's gonna radiate much more effectively into the water and the surface of the water is like a mirror, so sound doesn't travel from water to air very well because of the change in density. And so you are really hearing in air as a human, you're really hearing just a fraction of the, of the power of the water under, uh, or sorry, of the sound underwater. But if I'm under, but if I, if the sound is emanated by the prop underwater and I go 10 feet down and I listen yeah. to that same prop go by, let's say a quarter mile away from me, you're saying that the sound from that prop bounces against the surface of the water and bounces to me and I hear it um, and it's louder, it's a higher dB than yeah. if I was above the surface. Yes, there's much much more energy in the water than in the air for sure, yeah. Now do different fish make a different sound as they swim through the water? A whale's bigger, it's got yeah. more turbulence and fl water flowing around it. Does it make, is it louder as it swims than a small porpoise? And this, is, this is an interesting question, I don't know if anyone's ever actually detected the sound of like the hydrodynamics of these animals. Mostly we do detections by listening for their calls, which is not the optimal way to do it because they don't always call. Um, some animals chatter a lot more than others, right? Um, but certainly the larger marine animals, the baleen whales, they have tend to have lower frequency calls and the smaller, you know, the porpoises and the, and the, the dolphins, they have very high pitched calls, yeah. So now let's stay on that for a second. So you're saying whales, bigger ones, have a lower frequency sort of spectrum that they communicate in or chirp in. And mm -hmm. smaller mammals like porpoises have a higher frequency. That's their neighborhood of sound that they're, that they're communicating in? Yeah, yeah. Is and uh, you know, it has to, do with, has to do with the classic physics of size where you know, if you want a good subwoofer, you need a big speaker to make those large wavelengths. 
Um, so it's just more natural for larger things to emanate lower sound. Yeah. Now, um, you've just been describing mammals. Porpoises, whales, those are both mammals. Mm -hmm. Do fish, do bass make sounds? Do trout make sounds? Do tuna make sounds? They, a lot of fish make sounds. This is a much less popular area of research, but um, yeah, a lot of fish make really low frequency sounds, drumming and, and beating noises. Um, and I'm not too sure about the, the utility of their sounds. I think a lot of it's like social, um, but yeah, even like seahorses make sounds, uh, crustaceans will make sounds. Um, of course, the ubiquitous snapping shrimp, they're making sounds all the time. Um, on, the, on the coral reefs of the world. So a lot of animals use sound um, in ways I think that we fully don't understand for sure. So now you showed us these fascinating devices that you drop to the bottom of the ocean and listen to sound down there. Um, and uh, for instance, what does one of those things cost? And I realize there will be years of research to yeah. make, but just given oh. it went off the shelf tomorrow, what does one of those uh, you called it a Mark II. Which is the latest yeah. generation going to cost? Yeah. So that this is one of our my selling points. I would say is that we're talking like ten thousand dollars, may, maybe even less, just to just for the parts and and to put it together. Um, so you can imagine what it costs to build a submersible to go to those great de great depths. You know, there's a, a fellow out there right now uh, who's been diving in his in his submersible down to the bottom of the Challenger Deep, and that's you know. That's hedge fund money. That's hedge fund billionaire money, right? James Cameron, et cetera, uh, yeah. Victor Vivesco. Um, yeah. So in a sense, yeah, I try and say these are the, the, the cheapest way to get your instrument down to the bottom of the deepest depths. Um, other institutions like Woods Hole had an, had an autonomous vehicle, like a, a remote controlled submarine that could go to the great depths. And I believe the, the price tag was in the millions. I don't know exactly how much, but so we're several orders of magnitudes cheaper several uh, orders of magnitude less complex, but if you want to get something down there to make measurements, this is the way to go. So your device, it has specific gravity that causes it to sink on its own. It doesn't float. Yeah. So, so it goes down because it sinks gradually. Yeah. That specific gravity doesn't float. Uh, and when it's down there, do you let go of it or do you keep the cable attached to it so you can pull it back up? So there's no cable. It sinks under its own weight and we just completely let go of it. It's completely autonomous. Um, but what it has on board is a little computer that's looking at its speed, it's looking at its depth, it's looking at its battery, its temperature, it's looking at the data. And that little computer is making decisions every second whether it should return to the surface or not. And so usually we pre-program it to go down to a certain depth, stay there for a while, um, the bottom, and then drop the weight and come back up again. And the way, so it has this weight, this iron drop weight on the bottom, which is just a, you know, piece of milled iron from a master car that we screw into a bit of fishing line. The fishing line has a little nick um, exposing the steel core of the fishing line to the ocean water. And then we have a, another little um, screw, a little a screw that's plugged into a battery right by it. And we have a switch on that battery. And basically when the computer decides I need to return to the surface, it flips the switch, and then suddenly we start corroding that steel wire very quickly and it eventually fails, mechanically fails because the steel rusts away over a matter of seconds. The weight drops, it's an iron weight, so the ocean is iron limited. We're really helping uh, get some uh, nutrients into the ocean. And then the, the instrument changes from being heavy to buoyant and it returns to the surface under its buoyancy. So it's, uh, yeah, no thrust, no cables. <clears throat> and it does that because it's, it's got air captured inside of the capsule. Yeah, and so that capsule is a 15-inch glass sphere. So it's super buoyant. You can imagine how, you know, 15 inches. I mean, this is a, a great float, yeah. Mm -hmm. And when you said it's measuring its speed, you mean it's measuring its descent or ascent speed? Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. And how actually, we have, we have inertial navigation on there, so we're measuring its rotation and its tilt and all sorts of things. Yeah. How does it stay um, stable as it goes down? Why doesn't it tumble and roll over? We just made sure that the center of the center of gravity is below the center of buoyancy and with enough distance to give it stability as it falls. Yeah. Okay. So it's got, that's very much the case. The CG, the center of gravity is much lower than the center of stability uh, or buoyancy when it's going down. But yeah. when it's going back up, they're closer to each other, but it's still. That's is, right. 
CG is still below the center of buoyancy. Yeah, and actually one of the hardest things is to get it to float level on the surface. And that's, of course, uh, so we always are kind of like moving cables and adjusting little things, putting little, you know, taping a screw different places to try and get the weight to be perfectly balanced. It's a pretty difficult thing. Okay, so now in, in, um, on Earth, if I go out to my garden, I can dig around in a flower bed where we've got, you know, a real soft soil and uh, lots of nutrients, and then I can go find a clay deposit in the yard, and that's an area that's frequently bedrock, hasn't been disturbed. I live in Mill Valley, California, and I can actually go places which I don't think have been disturbed literally for a long time, thousands of years, and I can dig into that and um, get to, and I'll find rocks, here and there rocks. Okay, now, now in the ocean floor, we're all used to thinking of the ocean floor as being muddy and or sandy, but yeah. aren't there big rocks down there too? Give us, tell That's us what the composition of the ocean floor looks like in terms of mud, sand, rock uh, composition. So it changes wherever you go. And that's one of the reasons why we've been studying, for instance, how to measure that using sound um, passively. So if you're out, say you're out and you want to run your sonar to look for a submarine somewhere, well, first thing you need to know, what is my environment? So it'd be great if you could just stick your hydrophones in the, in the ocean, listen for a few minutes and say, okay, it's muddy bottom or it's a sandy bottom. Um, our most recent experiment was actually in the New England mud path. This is a fascinating part of the, the uh, eastern seaboard where you have a giant, like, like hundred, hundreds of square kilometers of mud that's been deposited up to 16 meters deep. So you have a huge layer of mud that's over top of sand. That would be over top of bedrock. Now, in our experiment, we were trying to figure out what's the sound speed in that mud. Um, but we actually needed a physical model. You know, I showed that silly long equation, we needed to modify that equation to actually include the layering. So we have the mud layer, we have the sound speed in the mud layer, the attenuation in the mud layer, the shear, the shear speed in the mud layer, the density of the mud, and then you have the sand layer. Uh, below that, we also have a sound speed in the sand, the density of the sand, etc. And then we have a thickness, how thick is that mud? And we actually found that just by listening, we could figure out how thick is the mud, what's the density in the mud, what's the sound speed in the mud, and what's the sound speed in the sand and the density in the sand. We are, we are, just by listening, the sound is sensitive to all of those things. Now you said earlier that when we listen in the atmosphere, in air above water to a sound, um, we can hear uh, sound, uh, when we're underwater, we can hear at a greater distance. We can hear sound a greater distance underwater than mm -hmm. when we're just in the atmosphere above water. Well, when you get to sound in the, in the dirt or you get to the ocean bottom, does the sound go through there at an even faster rate because it's denser than the water? Yeah, sound travels remarkably well in the earth and that's why we're able to have these large networks of seismographs and locate earthquakes, you know, on the other side of the globe um, and really learn about the, the core of the earth. That's all using vibration, which is sound, very, very low frequency vibration. Um, but still, yes, those are, the seismographer, you know, seis, uh, seismologists would never say they're studying sound, but studying vibration, certainly, yeah. So in terms of the sources of sound, you said earlier that waves are a big source of sound. Wind yeah. flowing across the water makes turbulence and causes waves, and that's a big source of sound. Am mm -hmm. I right in assuming that sound decreases as you go down in the depth? Is it quieter as you get deeper and deeper and deeper because you're farther away from the waves? Are there other reasons why it gets quieter? Yeah, so it, so it actually depends, and this is one of the things we've learned in our studies um, in the Challenger Deep. We thought it would be really, really quiet once you get to those very deep depths. And it turns out if it's a windy day, there's like 20 knots, 25 knots, um, the whole surface of the ocean is kind of like a uniformly lit light. And the further away you get, the more of it you see. And so the noise level was actually constant with depth under those conditions. Very interesting, right? Now, that was a bit of unexpected. Um, now, if, there, if it was a calm day, so I've been out, we went out another time to the Mariana Trench, made the same measurement, and it was like six knots, five knots of wind, glassy, calm r rollers. Um, yeah, as soon as you go away from the surface, it gets quieter and quieter. And actually, there's this thing in the ocean called the deep sound channel axis. 
and it's essentially a lens. So I, ref I kind of alluded this to this earlier, but at the surface of the ocean, you have like hot, relatively, you know, uh, hot, warm water. As you go down in depth, it becomes colder and colder. So the sound speed decreases. But then as you keep going down in depth, it starts increasing again because of the pressure, it becomes denser. And so you actually get a focusing lens where you have slow, fast, sorry, you have fast, slow, fast. And so when you put a sound into the, the slow part, it tends to get trapped like in a fiber optic cable um, in that waveguide. And they call this the sound channel axis. And that's really the, the mechanism in the deep ocean that allows sound to propagate thousands of kilometers. And so when you make a profile across that, it actually kind of, yeah, it starts off quite loud and gets quiet. And then you, you kind of hear sounds from thousands of kilometers away in a distant background. And then once you go below that fast layer, once you get out of that waveguide, then it gets really, really quiet. And that's, um, that's the neat thing about these, these hadal regions, these deep ocean trenches. Um, essentially, you get out of that waveguide and you only hear sounds that are directly above you. And on a calm day, those are basically non-existent. Um, so yes, it, it depends on the, on the conditions, like always. So how loud are the waves compared to like a ship transiting? Well, they're very quiet, but there's millions, trillions of them that you can hear at any given second, depending on your depth or, you know, what part of the ocean. You can really, once you, you know, if you average over 30 seconds, you're hearing just a huge number of waves breaking. And so the levels um, are comparable with ships. It's, you know, um, not so much uh, individual ship that's say a quarter mile away, but if you think about the Pacific Ocean, you know, there's kind of traffic all over the place, um, sounds traveling very efficiently. So you can hear ships from, you know, hundreds to thousands of kilometers away. Those levels start to become comparable with the locally generated wind noise. And so, um, in general, you can always hear ships at low frequencies, but not at high frequencies because the wind is masking the ships at higher frequencies. And so uh, can you uh, locate a ship? In other words, can you, do you have technology now where you can listen and say, ah, that is X ship a thousand miles away? Or can you not locate the ship? You just can hear the sound of a ship. Uh, people do work on that problem, mostly people in the defense world. Um, we. We've actually been working on a little a method for localizing ships that are on the order of uh, hundreds of kilometers away. Um, and really what we're trying to do with this method is we want to localize them and then we want to subtract their energy out of the, out of the power spectrum. So we know exactly um, how, how much, what energy they're contributing and what energy the natural world is contributing. So we do localize them in, the, in that sense, yeah. So can you identify a particular sound signature by a ship? Can you say that as an aircraft carrier, I'm imagining military applications of your technology yeah. and ask this question. Uh, we don't really specialize in that, but there's lots of people out there who have that knowledge. And actually there's lots of um, trained people who can do that by ear. You know, you, you've probably seen Hunt for the Red October or whatever, where he goes, you know, hang on a second. You know, there are people that are, you know, that's obviously a romanticization, but there are people who are very well trained at identifying um, propellers and, and, and uh, gearboxes and generators and all the details that go into the, the multi-spectral uh, sound generated by a ship. We, we tend to treat ships as a very um, uniform, uh, a fuzzy, fuzzy sphere, you know, because we, we're not so much interested in details of what ship is where, but uh, what's the contribution of all the ships? What are the contributions of the ship, you know, of the statistically representative ship? So there's a, there's a sailboat race in Southern California called the Anna Kappa race. When you race um, uh, westward from LA and we sail around Anna Kappa Island. Mm -hmm. And um, of course the shortest route is generally closest at the tips to Anna Kappa. And when we're sailing, you can see the waves and you can get closer or farther from the waves. Yeah. And having done it as a boy where we weren't using, the, we didn't have GPS in those days, I remember us getting really, really close to and seeing the bright phosphorescent waves breaking as we get close to the, the shoreline. Yeah. Now, if you're underwater, does it get louder as you get closer to the beach or louder as you get closer to shoreline? Absolutely. And, and so that's sort of like one, I think that's being hypothesized that large baleen whales might listen to the different, you know, qualities of shoreline 
to navigate over these, you know, they migrate huge distances. So you might sail by Monterey Bay, you might be, you might, sorry, you might swim by Monterey Bay and go, oh, there's Monterey Bay, you know. I, th I think that's maybe pushing, the, <laughs> pushing the, the level of the science, but I think that has been certainly thought about by people, yeah. So what's, I wanna learn a little bit about your profession. In your game, what are your working hours? Are you a, a nine to five kind of guy? Well, what, what do you, how do you spend your time? And you think about productive work time. What's your daily schedule like? Not counting the COVID yeah. aspect of it, but just normal. So totally aside from COVID, you know, my duties, I have to, I do a little bit of teaching. Um, I do research and that involves writing grants, um, writing papers, uh, applying for ship time, um, planning experiments, but then also just doing, you know, data analysis and, and working on theories and things like that. So um, I'm kind of a nine to five guy in that sense. Um, sometimes a little bit of work at night, you know. Um, and then of course we have field experiments where we go out and spend the entire day making measurements or we go on ships where we go for weeks at a time. Um, specific campaigns. So yeah, it, it kind of varies day to day, but it's definitely more sitting in front of a computer than sitting on a boat, unfortunately. So how many re how many sound researchers, and you might use a different term to describe mm -hmm. your, you know, niche of the profession, how many sound researchers are there in the world and where are they hanging out? Okay, well in terms of underwater sound, um, there's, there's, I'm going to say there's on the order of a couple hundred. It's kind of relatively small community. Um, and they're spread out, you know, across all the continents. Um, some people who are more interested in the biology, some people who are more interested in the physics, and then you have people who are more on the defense side, more on the environmental side, some people that do everything, a little bit of both. Um, and it's a very applied science. So people are always working on, you know, problems that have some applicability to an industry or a societal concern um, or environmental concern. Um, there are researchers all around the globe doing this, yeah. Um, so this is what you do for work. What do you do for recreation now? Um, do you well, spend his holiday? What, what do you do for recreation? A weekend, what are you gonna go do for recreation? Well, we have a 10 month old child, so I'm doing a lot of wholesome family activities, but uh, yeah, I, I like to do to sail when I can and, uh, you know, <laughs> garden. <laughs> and so there are boats like my youngster, which is an IOD in Chester, Nova Scotia. How yeah. far away is Chester from you? Um, it's just about an hour down the road. Yeah, not very far away at all. And, okay. uh, yeah. and so you, um, so how many days a year are you going to go, would you be sailing? Give me a well, interesting thing here, it's not very big in the winter. So it's a much more seasonal sport in the West Coast, even though the winters are getting warmer here. So that might, that might change over the next few decades. Um, but yeah, try and get out when I can. So David Barkley, it's been fascinating speaking with you. Yeah. And thank you very much for being our guest on the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon. Um, it's comforting to know that Researchers are studying the effects of sound uh, on sea creatures uh, and, and specifically mammals. And um, we'll want to hear from you if there are any scary things that are happening in the future. But um, we very much enjoyed our visit with you. And so yeah. thank you for being our guest on the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon. Yeah. Thank you so much for the invitation. Yeah, I really appreciate the interest. Thank you very much. And with that, our luncheon is adjourned. Thank you.